church. We don't come here to to get a lot of knowledge. You can do that on your own. You can read the Bible in your house, you can find stuff on the internet, and go to whatever to get knowledge. We are here to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what pastors do. He's teaching us how to do that. How to become a disciple. And then it is our duty to go out in the world and do the same thing. Teach people that don't know. So I feel like that's part of the path that God's God wants me to walk, that He has for me. Uh, I have this friend from high school. And we talked on occasion. And I was talking to her recently, and she was telling me how she wants to get out of where she lives because she doesn't feel safe. But at the same time, she's afraid that she won't be able to make it when she leaves. She's holding on to the physical things that she has. So I sent her some scriptures about overcoming fear and all that. And I remember one time she told me, I don't even know who you are. And I said, well, you're seeing the real me now. Mm. The person that God has always intended for me to be. That's Come on now. Yeah. I was asleep. Yeah. And now that blinders are taken off, yes. I, I, he can shine through me and, and I can to share you know, yes. the experiences in my life and all that. Yes. yes. Amen. So, Amen. I, have, I also have this friend that we used to work together and I don't know if he's a believer or not, but I remember one time sharing some news with him about something that happened, and he was like, oh, man, Robert, that is so awesome. You know, I, I even, uh, it's, it's so good that you're going to church and you gave your life to him like that. I even tried that prayer thing that you do. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and I pray that God will do something good for you. So that, to me, that, that, Show something that Mike and I were talking about a few days ago is that there's this hunger among people in this world yes. that is starting to show. Yes. So I encourage you to go and talk to whoever comes across your path. You never know what's going to happen. Right. It says in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone. Well, you can eat whatever you want. But if you're hungry spiritually, yeah. that's never going to be satisfied yeah. until you hear from the bread of life. Right. Remember right. that? Jesus, amen? Yes. 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 So, there's, there's a term um, in biology that is called the ecological niche. And it's defined as a way of life of the species. And the ecological niche describes how an organism or population responds to the environment. Yeah. Do a little science lecture here. Um, to me, this is my spiritual mm -hmm. niche. Mm -hmm. I am where I need to be. Mm -hmm. However, when I first came here, I told Mike, hey, I want to join the worship team. Mm -hmm. oh, I play drums. But I told him the other day, when I'm in my house, sitting behind my drum set, my drums and I become one, and I can do whatever. But when I sit there, I feel like I don't fit. I fit when I sit there mm -hmm. in the guitar, Come on now. singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I, I taught myself how to play guitar. However, I took lessons to learn how to play drums when I was 13. And I have sang ever since I was in elementary school. I've been in choirs all the way to high school. But I've always been afraid of singing in front of people. And uh, it's not like I'm some sort of superstar in the world, American Idol or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when, I, when I, when people come, hey, sing something, I'm like, mm, no, it's not going to happen. But when I sit there, yeah. it's like everything's gone. Yeah. And no one is going to stop me from sitting there and playing guitar and opening my mouth and worshiping God. Because when I do that, everything becomes clear. Yes. And everything makes sense for me. Mm -hmm. I remember my sister told me uh, a few months ago, she sent me a message. She said, hey, you need your 
they're saying that God gave that to her to show her, to show other people that even though she has that, her faith is still strong. Well, some of that is true. Her faith is strong, like she had the cancer, but God didn't give it to her. And if it wasn't for that uh, funeral, I would have got walked out because it was it was almost sickening to hear what they were saying about God. So we need to pray for those people. Maybe give the priest a vision of who, we, who Jesus really is, and uh, start telling the truth about him. You know, yes. because I know I was in a funeral, but it just made me mad the way they were representing. Blaming him for some stuff. I mean, not really blaming, but people that know who Christ is, it sounded like it, it, that he was blaming God for it. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just didn't like it at all. I feel bad. You know. So I just think we need to pray for the church. Yes. And not just the other churches that are representing him well. Yeah. Amen.
And he told the people, he said, today, we're going to know who's God is yes, God. That's right. And the people said, that's good. Yeah. That's what we want to know. Yeah. I believe there are millions and millions of people who really want to know who is. Mm -hmm. Who yeah. is the right one? Is, yeah. is it really Jesus? Or is it Muhammad? Or is it, you know, who is it? And God will always answer. Jane and I were talking this morning. Think of this. 430 years, people were born and died in slavery in Egypt. But the thing that kept them going, how they endured, was the promise that a deliverer was going to come. Right. They never saw it. But they never gave up hope. Right. And that's the only way they endured the misery they went through. And when God said he's going to do something in our yes. lives or in right. the life of the church, yes. I don't care what it looks like. Right. I'm only telling you this because I have to tell myself this. I have to pump myself up. I have to I have to tell myself things because, you know, the enemy comes against us in every way. And every, yes. He use things that you never even thought of right. until you're, you're in it, and it right. takes a while, but the Holy Ghost will always bring us yes. to the revelation of who we're up against That's right. and how he uses the flesh. Who condemns me? My flesh. That's right. I don't believe I can do this or that, and I get to thinking about it, and I go, I don't deserve it. No, I don't. But I'm telling you, that is a reality that we all face. We, every time we try to get a hold of God, the enemy yes. will bring up everything yes. we thought, said, saw. Yeah. No. Always. Right. And that feeling of, of I don't deserve, I, I just can't hardly face God. And all the time, it's a lie. Yes. I can't do anything. And that's hard. In this realm, everything, if you want to get ahead, you better be ready to work your rear end off. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to hand you this or that. But in that realm, yes. it's just accept it. And that's yes. very hard for us to do. Somebody gives you something, at least, you know, I, it's really hard for me to handle that. Yeah. I want to be the one given. Yeah. But we have to be able to, to accept. But anyhow, I'm sorry I ran with it. No, I just feel like God is wanting us to realize, you know, we really need each other. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 We don't even realize how bad we need each other. We need right. each other pulling for each other. And to realize our humanity. Yeah. We're all, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. Somebody doesn't come in here for a long time, uh, we, we don't say, well, where you been? No. We say, gosh, I'm glad to see you. Yeah. I'm so right. glad you're back. Or, you yes. know, you're here. Or Is there anything that we can do or what can I do? What can I say? What you know? Yeah. Treat them like we want to be treated. That's right. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yeah, and in conjunction with that, it's we do need each other, and um, you know, as we pray and we're getting ready to as a as a collective body, and um, I just it just keeps coming to my mind, and and for me especially because. Um, I've allowed what I see to dictate to me how it's going to end up. Right. That's that's not you know what I see is not the reality of it. Right. It's been said different ways, and uh, but um, you know just continue to pray uh, with us to lift my wife up. Um, she's doing a lot better, but um, there's still that that battle that's there, and you know for for one person. Um, you may view uh, what I view as a tragedy as well, that's that's not tragic. What it, we're all different. We all deal with things yes. differently. Yes. And at the same time, it's I'm not asking you to just you know, hey Lord, lift up. No, just bind together with me because there is a um, there's some help for her, and um, I think we can all speak to the fact that financial blessings are real and that we could all use one. Amen. Yes. And I don't see anywhere where I should be limited That's right. by a dollar. That's right. I should not be limited by a dollar. So um, not just pray with us, but to proclaim with yes. us that it's already done, it's already yes. taken care of, no and that, um, that, that, that deliverance, that that healing is in fact real and it's, it's taking place. Yes, amen. Yeah. And uh, with up Cindy, she had an interview with a place she applied for over a year ago. Um, 
praying for favor for that second interview to come forth with uh, the freeder up on a lot of things that are tying her up right now so she can move forth in the direction she will do. And also, uh, <clears throat> she uh, was, as they were delivering her and Brooke were delivering papers this morning, they caught a, caught a uh, ad, or not an ad, but an article about uh, heavy uh, equipment that was former military equipment being uh, absorbed by the local small town places, uh, full armament and stuff. And it looks pretty, it looks pretty wicked. They claim it under the situation of protecting sheriffs and stuff where they can get more or less a SWAT team in these little backwoods towns and stuff like that. And it looks like there's some kind of buildup going on and stuff, but we understand that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Uh, but there is raising concern and uh, just praying for the people that are in fear of these situations that they would understand that fear does not come from the Lord, that there would be wisdom and knowledge and understanding and strength to understand and deal with these situations. Yes. Amen. My uh, sister-in-law, Rose, had a CAT scan yesterday. Tomorrow she's having an MRI. Just pray that they figure out what's going on. She's refused to go to the doctor, standing on the word of God for over six months now. Um, but it's just finally got so bad. Also, um, when I went to take Evelyn to the hospital last week, I walked out to go to my car when her daughter came to get her suitcase and whatnot, and I saw Mary Kate who came here, the older lady that was healed of diverticulitis, and then she was also in the emergency room, was about to pray with her, and amazing how the Lord puts you. <laughs> yep. Right there, you're going for one reason, you wind up for a second reason, but she had a slight stroke, so I told her we remember her in prayer also, her name is Mary, and keep remembering Evelyn. They basically determined it's just severe arthritis in her arm, which manifests the same as a heart condition, so she has a hard time differing what's really going on in her body, but the Lord can heal her of this arthritis too. Amen. In his name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I got a call from my mom, uh, my grandma, who's going to be 100 this July. Uh, they took her into the hospital there. She had a slight heart attack. I haven't heard any more situations beyond that and I'm praying for her total healing and everything else and then Miles, her son uh, he's been smoking most of his life and uh, now he's in a battle with cancer uh, so I just pray for uh, deliverance from the cigarettes and then also the healing of the cancer at the same time uh, he knew of the Lord when he was young I don't know where Stan is right now but pray that the, he calls out to the Lord and then the Lord will take her so Amen
Feel worship coming on. What do you say? You all ready to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? He is worthy. Glad to have you back, Tammy. We've missed you.
sitting on a throne somewhere with his big finger pointing at us saying, you did this and you did that. What a scowl. But he sits loving on us through his son who has washed all those things away. Who loves us as his own because we are his own now. Hallelujah. There is no
this awesome God, Tammy and the, and the worship team has been singing about just with this song alone, that He, I mean, untouchable, unspeakable the glory, and yet He came down and made Himself one of us so that He could relate to our humanity. And now we are holy. Let me tell you something. You are as holy as Jesus Christ. I know that's hard to imagine, but we have to be or we wouldn't be able to come into the presence of God. God made it that way because He wanted us. For God so loved the world. I mean, this is, this is awesome. This is beyond religion. I don't, you, know, you can't express it with religion. It's just pure love. Love in a way that most of us never, ever understand in any human way. No demand. No expectation. Just love. He just loves you. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're not just talking about physical healing here. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We receive it, Lord. We receive it, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. I believe you more Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you are all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
praise God. Let's praise the Lord for what He's doing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. I think that that is the healing of the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. The hurt, the religion, the the misunderstandings. This is the body of Christ that needs to be healed in this world. Praise God. This is a burden that all of our hearts groan and cry out for. We see the, the casualties of this battle that has been raged in this world. The people that fall away that can't believe that God could be so good. That God could love so purely. That God could accept them just as they are. Yes. That is the healing that is the most powerful. Thank you, Lord. And this physical body, we need healing in those too. But that is just a a shadow of the healing God has planned. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, worship team. As always, praise the Lord. Great job. Thank uh, Suzanne and Mark for uh, stepping up and ministering over the last week while we were gone. I appreciate it very much. We had a lot of fun. We enjoyed the trip out and back. Well, actually, we enjoyed being there more than we enjoyed the trip out and back, but praise the Lord. It was good. uh, Hallelujah. Good to see everybody here this morning. Appreciate what God is doing. And uh, I, do, I do believe that, uh, you know, that the supernatural isn't something we always see. Generally, we sense it more than we see it, and simply because of the Spirit of God that is in us. But God is always doing something. He's never idle. He's never just, you know, kind of hanging out, waiting. So things are happening in us and through us all the time. Whether we're really aware of it or not is another issue. Uh, To be sensitive to the Holy Spirit just helps us to kind of relate to that and understand what is really going on in our lives and in this world. We see one thing, but there's a whole other reality uh, that's taking place. Uh, Jason and I were talking a little bit before church, and he was talking about how Satan, knowing or not knowing uh, the person of Jesus, but uh, the world was seeing one thing. They, they were seeing a rebel, uh, you know, a, a prophet, and, uh, and either based on their opinions, either just, justly being crucified or, or being singled out and abused but there was a whole reality that that never touched. And that was the purpose and the plan that God had. And Jesus, he understood it, but uh, it took him a, a life to really grasp it. I mean, I, again, the conversations we've had in the past, I remember talking with Don here just recently too, and this is, this is really the truth. I, I don't think, you know, Jesus wasn't born knowing what he was going to do. He was born a man. He grew in stature and in knowledge, and his mother was sharing with him what the the angel had spoken to her and so forth through his life. And he began to find himself in the Word of God. He declared that the first sermon he ever preached. He stood up and and preached about himself. He said, uh, the the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, to, to deliver the poor, you know, to set at liberty them that are captive, and so on and so forth. And then... It says he closed the book before he got to the part of the the day of the Lord, the judgment of God, because we're still in that place where he closed the book. We're still in that place of grace, not judgment, but in grace. And they picked up stones and tried to kill him. They ran because they understood what he was saying. He's saying that's me. I'm talking the Messiah that is being predicted here or prophesied here. I've discovered that's me. They weren't ready for the revelation. But the truth is, when we search these scriptures, not only are we finding Jesus, but we find ourselves. 
That's what the Bible's for. It's not a, it's not a how-to book in terms of do this, do this, do this, and avoid those things, and then this will happen. It's a, it's a revelation of who Jesus is, and therefore a revelation of who we are in Christ. And so we need to have a, a perspective of, of ourselves and of Christ that God has. I, the identity that he gives us. So I want to talk to you this morning about, about our life. Now, if, if you will, uh, Sheila, let's go to James chapter 4, verse 14. I've got a whole lot of scripture here, and I want to use more scripture than I do my own words. Uh, because, obviously, the scripture is going to have a heck of a lot more import and impact than my words will. But there's something very simple and yet profound about everything in this book. And I, one of the things we talk about, you know, uh, as Christians, we think we're, you know, we're, we're screwing up and that we're repenting all the time, constantly asking for forgiveness and hoping that God will forgive us. And I mean, I understand that because that's what religion teaches us. That's what the world teaches us. You screw up, you got to get forgiveness. Uh, you mess up, uh, you know, the rules, and then you got to get forgiveness. But Jesus died once and for all. Yes. He forgave us everything at that moment. So anything you did today or you might do tomorrow is not going to come as a shock to God. He's already seen it and forgiven you for it. We don't need to keep coming back and pleading with God to forgive me for something that he forgave me for 2,000 years ago. I'm not saying we shouldn't be thankful. Life should be a celebration. It ought to be a, 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 a celebration of thanksgiving because that's what real freedom is. I'm no longer bound by can I repent enough? You know, can I get low enough? Can I grovel enough? Can I plead? Can I beg enough? Can I be, uh, you know, somehow influential enough to get God? to do something for me that he already did. Amen. The other side of that is religion. The other side of that is, is the law. But it says that he gave a sacrifice. The high priest, under the time of the law, the priests in general, but the high priest in particular, were always standing, the scripture says. Always standing, offering one sacrifice after another. There was, it was continuously offering of sacrifices, and the offering of those sacrifices, all those offerings of those sacrifices did in the natural was remind the people of their sin. Now it did, yes, the blood covered them till the next sacrifice or till the next day of atonement, but God himself said the sacrifices just simply reminded them. So when, you're, when we're coming back over and over and over, thinking repentance is me begging and pleading God to forgive me for the latest screw-up that I did, I'm, I'm asking Jesus to be sacrificed again for something he's already done it for. Amen. And all it does is remind me of me. Yes. It puts the focus back on me and my weakness and my failures instead of on Jesus and the perfect sacrifice. Because he, yes. once he offered that sacrifice, it says he sat down. Yeah. He's through ministry. He's through offering sacrifices. He forever makes intercession. That doesn't mean he's up there every time he sees me do something that, I, that uh, isn't proper or correct. He doesn't go, uh, please, Father, don't, don't punish him. No, his presence is the intercession, is the continuous intercession. The fact that a man, a God man, is seated in heaven is the declaration that I have been redeemed. I've been reconciled. There is no more, therefore, there is no more need for him to plead my cause. He pled it, God accepted it, and it's done. It's finished. Praise the Lord. So then I want to talk about our life. Not our dying out to things, but our life. Our living a life that is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Most of us haven't experienced that. We've tasted more of the dying and the grieving and the, and the worrying and the fretting and the anxiety when God delivered us from all of that. Even Isaiah says, in, in uh, I believe it's Isaiah 54, he says, look, or, or 48, excuse me. He says, uh, he, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Yes. That means your sins are taken care of, and you should live peaceful. Yes. 
And peaceful doesn't mean laying in a cave somewhere meditating your navel. It means at peace. Live happy. Be happy. Don't worry. Everything's good. Everything's covered. You've got nothing to worry about. Praise the Lord. So let's go. James chapter 4, verse 14. He says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? Now, he goes on to say, It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. But the question I have is, what is your life? As believers, as Christians, I can truthfully say, I can answer that question, and it's Jesus. Amen. Our identity, our purpose, our significance are not located in anything that we can do or anything that we can achieve or attain. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Amen. Who you really are. Yes. Who you already are in Christ. Now it doesn't say that Christ, who's a part of your life. It says Christ, who is your life. Praise God. Jesus is our life. Amen. And that's not complicated. That doesn't mean I'm making my life by pretending to be him or acting perfectly and all. It says he is. He is our life. God sees him as me. He is my life. That's my life. My life isn't predicated or determined by or defined by this flesh or what I do or don't do. My life is Jesus. Your life as a believer, it's Jesus. Amen. Colossians 3.3, 3. just back up one here, if you can. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Man, it doesn't get any bigger than that. You're dead. What you think you are is dead as far as God's concerned. Amen? Amen? But your life, the real life, what life really is, is hid with Christ in God. Amen. All God sees of you is Christ. Amen. Paul said it like this. When I look at a brother or a sister in the Lord, now he had plenty of ways to, to, he could have defined them and described them. Adulterers. Mm -hmm. Incestuous people. Mm -hmm. Drunkards. I mean, I'm just describing the things he said that he dealt with in the church, not, not the heathens, not the pagans, but the people that were in the church. And he said, but I have determined this, that when I look at you, I'm going to see nothing but Christ and him crucified. Why? Because Paul had a revelation that what he saw was not who they were. Their life was hid in Christ, in God. They were dead. And I know this sounds like, uh, you know, an impossibility, but we need to look at these things According to the word of God. Right. Not according to our religion. Not according to our natural way of thinking. Because that just screws us up. The natural mind is enmity with God. It's at cross purposes with God. Right. That church. Is gospel freedom. Yes. Yes. If you ever really get a revelation of this. I'm not saying you won't get upset with yourself. Or disappointed in yourself. I'm saying. The reality is, you are dead. Yes. And your life is hid with Christ in God. That is the liberty, that is the freedom that Jesus came to give us. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Our lives ought to be, if they're anything, they ought to be free. They ought to, we, people ought to look at us and say, my God, they are free. They, they are liberated. They are happy. They're, they're not all bound up and, and freaked out and, and depressed. They're so dumb, they're happy. That's the way the world would look at it. 
But I'm okay with that because he says the wisdom of this world is what's foolishness. The dumbness of me, the, the, the idiocy of a believer is wisdom beyond their understanding of the natural man. It takes the wisdom of God. It takes the mind of Christ. Praise God. Philippians uh, 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. In other words, Paul says, this I believe. I believe this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Right. And we just read a moment ago, when he appears, we'll appear with him. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. So Paul says, I'm sure of this. And so should we. We ought to be sure, too, that no matter how screwed up it looks, yeah. I'm confident of this, yeah. that he that began this work in me, because nobody comes to God except the Spirit draws them, he that began this work in me had a purpose in that work, and it was going to be completed. I know, he says in Jeremiah, I know the plan I have for your life. It's a good end. Yeah. It's a good thing, and it's going to have a good end, too. Amen. That's... Me. That's God speaking to me. That's God speaking to you. That's his attitude about us. Amen? 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Yes. You, you ought to leave here today with no doubt that you are perfect in Christ. Amen. And you're not going to make yourself any better, nor can you make yourself any worse. Amen. This is the work of God. Period. No man. I will not share my glory with another. How is he glorified? The scripture says his grace will bring glory to him throughout eternity. Not, not our work. Not our sacrifices. Not our labors. Not our service. But his grace. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. 2 Thessalonians uh, 1, verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Yes. Praise the Lord. Uh, go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians, I think it's uh, 1, no, 3, 3. Try that, let's see. Three, three. No, it's Second Thessalonians three, three. Sorry, Sheila, I'm trying to remember. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. The Lord will. You won't. He will. He's faithful to do that. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. He's faithful. He establishes us. And keeps us from evil. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We need to understand this gospel. And everything that this gospel accomplishes in our lives. The gospel. You know, I, I, I hesitate to even say this because it gets into our heads and we think it's. Look, you're not going to do this. You're not going to be the best you. I mean, we, you know what I'm saying? We, we should be moral people. We should be good people. We should do right. You know what I mean? But I'm not, that's not my message. That's not God's message. His message is the gospel will transform you. The trouble is we haven't had a true, pure gospel. We've had a little bit of the gospel and a little bit of the law, and we've lost everything. So we're doing and doing and doing, trying to be what the Bible says we are, and we're, it was never meant for us to do. It was meant for us to believe. Yes. The more we focus on it, the greater failures we are. 
That's the weapon that the devil, the devil uses the law. The devil uses religion. I mean, this is huge. And it's the true gospel. Isaiah 48 and 6. I'm going all over the Bible here just to show you that it's not just, this isn't just something that we pull out of a scripture here or there in the New Testament, but it's everywhere. Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it. I have shewed thee new things, new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. Now, in, in Revelation, he says it like this in Revelation 21, 5, Behold, I make all things new. Everything is getting made new. We are new creatures in Christ. There is a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. There is a new creation. God, that's what God is doing. Praise the Lord. God worked in the gospel of Christ, in the good news of Jesus, to reconcile himself to all things, not just you and I, but to everything. Making them new. Okay, back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. That is a, it's a parallel scripture to Romans chapter 8, verse 22, where he says the whole creation groans. For this reconciliation or this reuniting or reconnecting with its original purpose. And God's making all things new. Amen. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Praise the Lord. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, he says, fear not, little flock. Fear not. Why? Why? Because it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Not for you to earn it. Not for you to strive to get to the kingdom or get into the kingdom or have the kingdom. But don't be afraid. It's your Father's pleasure. It's your, it's your, it makes Him feel good to give it to you. To give you the kingdom. We're struggling for the kingdom. Come on. He wants to give us the kingdom. That's His purpose. That's His desire. That's His his love for us expressed. And I, I understand that all of us at some level are aware of our imperfections, aware of our sins. Amen. Well, most all of us, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. In other words, our need to be transformed. But how? Because I don't know about anybody else, but Assuming that we're all human here, we screw up. We do things we're really ashamed of, we're sad about, we're upset, we wish we hadn't said or done or whatever. But it just happens. I'm not excusing it, I'm not quantifying it or qualifying, I'm just saying it happens. So what exactly needs to be changed? I mean... If, if we were in churches that I've been a part of in the past, I'd need to come down here and repent. I'd need to cry for a while. I'd need to do a whole bunch of stuff in order to get it all together. And there's nothing wrong with coming to the altar and praying. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying that would have been the demand. Repent. Confess. Beg. Plead. Do whatever you got to do but get God's attention so that he can forgive you. Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 9, and we're going to go through verse 14. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Do you see us having any part in any of this? Not even the faith. The faith isn't even ours. 
which the, uh, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Yeah. Amen? If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. This is Paul talking. Right. Not before he got saved. Years after he's been saved. Uh, after he's been given this great revelation. Right. Two-thirds of the New Testament. Not like I was already perfect, but I follow after that. After, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Yeah. I want to have what Jesus gave me. Exactly. Yeah. I want to be who he declared me to be. Right. I want to apprehend what he apprehended for me. Yes. Amen. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Uh -huh. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. What was behind him? The law, Pharisee, works. Yeah. All that which are behind and reaching for under those things which are before the grace of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, and the eternity of God. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. He's pressing towards what God has already declared him to be. Yes. Now, the root of all sin and how it's effectively dealt with is right here. You're either... Your own God and idols working yourself, getting better and everything else. Or the opposite of that, how sin is dealt with is to simply believe what God has said. Amen. Accept who you are. Realize, I'm not measuring myself as though I had, from the outside, I look, I look and I say, I'm not there yet. I have not arrived. And yet, God has done it all for me. God has accomplished it all. Look, let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 again. This is the same Paul writing. So his thoughts, they're connected. Ours are not always connected. We see it as different books of the Bible or different uh, thoughts. But look, Paul's only got one brain. This is all coming out of that same brain. There shouldn't be conflict there. There shouldn't be uh, you know, controversy. For ye are, back to what we just read. For ye are dead and your life is hid with God with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Yeah, I'm going to get a glorified body one day and it's going to look just like who I already really am. Yeah, Paul says that's what I'm reaching for. Yes. I'm reaching for this reality, this knowledge, this revelation of being dead and my life being hid in Christ. So that when Christ, who is my life, shall appear, then I will appear. Amen. Instead of trying to make Jesus appear in me, I don't have to do that. Right. Jesus will show up, and I'll be identified with him when he shows up, wherever he shows up, Amen. whenever he shows up. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. Uh, you can look here. God has covered our past, our present, and our future, and he's covered it completely. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is what's so great about it. Yes. He didn't miss anything. There was no error. There wasn't a, a thing I left undone. I can't surprise him with my behavior. Come on, I can shock you, maybe. <laughs> but I cannot surprise God. Amen. Now, oh, praise the Lord. I, I, I guess I'm just saying, I don't know, I, I don't know. But for me, that is unimaginable. Because mm -hmm. I can be stupid. I can be as ignorant as the day is long. But not in the eyes of God. He's the love is blind God. Praise the Lord. So, why, and I'll leave you out of this, why do I struggle with anger, jealousy, bad habits? I'm, okay, just yeah. pick your own adjective there. Why do I give in to temptation? <clears throat> now, you can look at this two ways. You can try to right now be thinking about what, I wonder what that was. <laughs> <laughs> 
or you could just put yourself in there. Because there's a whole list that I could go on for a long time with. But the Bible makes it clear that if you're a Christian, each of us is genuinely a new creature. Genuinely a new creature. But not yet a totally new creature. I know that sounds like a contradiction, but clearly the Bible teaches us we are genuinely new. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are therefore now a, a new creation, new creature in Christ. A new species is one uh, uh, definition or, or uh, translation. And yet, we're not totally a new creature. Even though we are fundamentally new. We're not yet completely new. Praise the Lord. We still struggle with sin. Now, I'm trying to do what Paul does, and obviously not as good as well, but we're dealing with two dynamics. So we're de dealing with a spiritual reality and a physical fact physical fact, a spiritual truth. Uh -huh. We deal with it every day. That's Christianity. We look at things that are not as though they are. Uh -huh. We live in a world that's constantly giving, sending us information that is bogus. Right. Right. It's factual, but it's not the truth. Yeah. Right. Yes. So we have to think spiritually according to the Word of God so that we don't focus on the facts and lose track of the truth. That's, right. that's Supernatural. That's spirituality. We're, we, we get so hung up on the, on the spectacular that we miss the supernatural. Amen. Praise God. We struggle with sin because sin has not yet been destroyed in our lives. Sin has been dethroned in our lives so that it doesn't reign over us anymore. It doesn't rule us. We're not subject to it. But sin remains in us, in our flesh. Amen. Let me show you. Romans 7, verses 17 through 20. Now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is Paul speaking after he went through his whole uh, uh, essay, more or less, on the harder I want to do good. The more I screw it up, the more I concentrate on trying to be a good person, I still foul up. I, I want to do the right thing, but somehow in the heat of the moment, I lose my temper, I, I do, I say, I be, I, whatever. You know what I mean? That's what he's talking about. But he says, so now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that's in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So you can think whatever you want to think about what I might have done, but I'm telling you, you've got the same flesh I do, and there's nothing in it that's any good. We could grade our failures and behaviors and so on and so forth on any scale you want to pick, but the truth is we all got flesh, and our flesh in our flesh, there's nothing of any value to God. There's no good thing. So that is, but sin that dwelleth in me, for I, I know that in me, that's in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. I want to do right. I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I don't want to upset somebody. I don't want to, I don't want to do a bad thing. I don't want to, you know, have people have a, a bad image or uh, impression of me, but... I, that's what I feel, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Yeah. Not for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. That sounds like Malaysian. Yeah. It's, actually, it's actually old English. But for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Yeah. Now, if I do that, I would not. Now, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, then it's not me that's doing it. But sin that dwelleth in me, in my flesh, which is what he just talked about a little, a little bit ago. That's what we're dealing with. We, sin doesn't reign over us. In other words, sin is not our God anymore. We've been delivered from that. God is our God. But sin's still in me because I still have flesh. My flesh did not get delivered. It won't get delivered until the resurrection. What got delivered was who I really am. What got born again, what is like God, is my spirit. And your spirit, and it is perfect in him. It's holy, it's righteous. You are hid in Christ. Yes. 
who you really are is what Jesus reveals. That's what God sees. Who we think we are has nothing to do with God whatsoever. He doesn't connect with flesh. It's the spirit. He came to dwell in our spirit, not in our flesh. Praise God. The change that's taken place in us is, no matter how I define it, this we're just talking about the way we are this morning, the change that's taken place is still, it's just as radical, in fact, it's more radical. It's more real than us coming in and then trying to abide by a set of rules or regulations. Now, the church, that's what the church calls change. That's not what God calls change. What God calls a radical and real change is when we believe in the finished work of the cross. In spite of what we might be seeing. I mean, this is the basis of Christianity. How is it that we can accept that we look at things as, uh, that are not as though they are when it comes to sickness or disease, but not our own frailties and those of others? Because you can't have grace for others if you don't have any grace for yourself. Our struggle is the same struggle that Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 7. Okay, let's go to Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And we'll go through verse 9, 1 through 9. Galatians 4, 1 through 9. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. This is talking about the law. The tutors and governors are the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Even though they were the children of God, they weren't mature children. I mean, they, they, they didn't understand grace. They didn't understand the love of God, so they were kept under the law and the prophets. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Again, he's referring to the law there. But when the fullness of time, of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more servant a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are, and here's the critical expression here, it's not what we know. It isn't what we know about God. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Going back to the law, going back to works, and so on and so forth. The interesting phrase here, the one I want to just kind of point out is where he says, and then in the fullness of the time, God does something. It's the way he always does it. There's a perfect time, and it's the fullness of time that God does these things. And so the fullness of time for each of us, the reality is as we grow in understanding the gospel and to learn to receive the rest Everything that Jesus purchased for us. That is the fullness of time. How do I know that? Because that's when the sun appears. When it's no longer me trying to make up a picture of him for somebody to see. But I'm resting in the finished work. He shows up. People are drawn to that. That's the fullness of time. If our goal is conquering sin, instead of resting in the finished work, we actually shrink spiritually. I know it sounds counterintuitive, you know, but the truth is our responsibility is not to conquer sin. Jesus conquered sin. Our responsibility is to rest in that finished work. The only way, that's the only way God can transform us. 
The more we're messing with it, the longer it takes. The less of God appears in our lives. Praise the Lord. See, the irony of the gospel, and, and this is it's, it's throughout the entire Bible, the, the unavoidable, inescapable, is we are transformed in life as we grow in understanding. And the understanding that our relationship with God is based on Christ's performance for us and not our performance for him. Christ. It's, it's everywhere in the Bible. But it's an irony because we never quite grasp it. It's ironic that we're here trying to do all this stuff when the gospel is trying to tell us Here's the great news. You don't have a part to do in this. Praise God. That church is our fullness of time. And in the fullness of time, there's going to be a great revival. There's going to be a great outpouring of his of God's spirit, unlike has ever been seen by man. And it's going to come in the fullness of time, just like everything else God does. And God allows us a part to play in that fullness of time. Not something to do, just something to believe. Praise God. We ought to be celebrating right now. We ought to be the happiest people, the most, you know, even-tempered and centered and... and uh, you know, at ease and, and at peace with each other and with everything else around us. The fullness of time, see, brings fullness of blessing. You can't get everything the Bible's telling us we're supposed to have. I struggle with this all the time and have ever since I got born again because there's things God said to me that I'm not experiencing, but yet I know he said it. Yes. There's things that we see as a church, as a body, just as believers that we should be experiencing, but we don't experience, not on any consistent level. And it's because the blessing can't come to the immature, to the servant. It's got to come to those children who have grown up and realize, I have an inheritance coming. It's not me that's doing anything to get it. It's my father just wants me to have it. And he's just waiting on me to come to the fullness of time. So that I can have the fullness of the blessing. There's a time in this realm, in this world, in space and time and matter that God has predetermined just like he did when you would be saved, if you would be saved, you know, how you would be saved, in other words. Right. And it's just as true in every other area of our life. And, and, it's, and it had nothing to do with you. We think it's, well, I, I really got fed up with my sin. God. No, we weren't. We were fed up with the consequences. And we were saved before the foundation of the world. We were saved before the first consequence of our sin ever showed up. Outside of just being born. Praise the Lord. So we ought to be celebrating. For what we've already been given the title deed to. I'd, I'd go there, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. I've talked about this a lot of times before, but in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the first, I think, 14 verses is all about what God does for us if we obey. Yeah. And it's blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in your finances, blessed in your health, your family's blessed, your children are saved, your cattle are taken care of. I mean, everything you can imagine, the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower, all of the positive things in the world. For 14 verses, he says, That's, this is the result of obedience. And then, beginning at verse 14 or 15, wherever it is, he starts telling you what the curses are for disobedience. I never read past verse 14 because <laughs> I, I have been declared perfectly obedient in Christ. Jesus kept every bit of that law. The consequences of that are still valid. They're still real. They're still true. That's the promises of the Spirit 
in the New Testament. They're still there. Healing, wholeness, deliverance, financial blessing, breakthrough, no weapon formed against you. All of those things are ours. And we had nothing to do with it. Jesus fully fulfilled the law. And the Bible itself says that the law remains in effect. As long as the sun goes up and the sun comes down, as long as snow falls from heaven, it, it, forever the law will be the, the measuring stick. And so the consequences of the law are still in effect. You're either a believer in Christ who has kept all of the law, which justifies you, reconciles you to God, makes you av available to all the blessings of God, or you're outside of the kingdom and you're under the curses. Not because you did anything, but because you didn't believe in the one who did everything. Praise God. That, that's the whole idea. The prom, think about the promises that, that God gives us to the one who conquers or to the one who overcomes. Right? Yeah. We are more than conquerors. We are more than overcomers through Christ yes. who saved us. Yes. Because he did it all. He overcame it all. And that makes us more than overcomers. Yes. He conquered sin, death, and hell. And now we are more than conquerors because of what he's done. Amen? Now, we are one with the conqueror. We are one with the overcomer. So let's look at just a, just a, a few of these. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. This is what you got coming. Because of him. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, eternal life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's yours. Yes. Amen? Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen. Praise God. Verse 17. He that hath an ear. How many times the Scripture talks about ears they have, but they hear not. Amen. Eyes they have, but they see not. So if you got an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Uh -huh. Revelation of God's word. Yeah. And will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name. Uh -huh. Written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Think of all the times God changes people's names throughout the Old Testament. Why? Yes. Because he wants to bless them. Yeah. Yes. He gives them a name that identifies with who he sees them as. Yes. Abram. I'm going to call you Abraham because you're the father of many nations, although you've never had any kids. You're 100 years old. It doesn't look like anybody could ever expect you to have any kids, but you're going to be the father of all those that be blessed. Yes. Yes. Jacob, deceiver, liar. I think I'll call you a prince with God. I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to give you a name that identifies you with the way I see you. My prince. I'm the king. You're the prince. You're the inheritor of everything the king has. Praise God. He's going to give you a new name. In fact, he's already given you a new name. And it's so intimate and so personal that only you and him will know it and understand the significance of it. Praise God. Uh, chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That sounds like righteousness to me. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's what's happening. Amen. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write him upon my, and I will write upon him my new name. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, verse twenty-one. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, 
even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Now let me show you in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Just to show you that these things are done. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, how did, where does this come about? Paul tells us the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2 and 6. We are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Thank you, Lord. Why? Because we are overcomers. Why are we overcomers? Because he overcame. Yes. And we believed. Yes. Praise God. Amen. All right, Colossians 2, 6 through 14. And we'll, we'll wrap this up. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 14. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As long as, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now, how did you receive him? We've been talking about this since the beginning. We just believe. So how do you walk in Jesus? You just believe. You believe he directs your steps. Just what was spoken of this morning. You believe the people that you come into contact with are the people that God wants to speak to. The people that God wants to reveal himself to. You just walk. Amen? Rooted and built up in him and established, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's no more of God than that. And ye are complete in him. Everybody say complete. complete. <laughs> That's good. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Now, look, see what he's saying? He, this is done. So the body, I've been circumcised. My flesh has been circumcised from my spirit as far as God is concerned. So he doesn't see the sin in my flesh because as far as he's concerned, it's been, done, it's been cut off. It's done away. Amen? Without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him, in baptism, this is how it happens. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Faith in the resurrection power of God. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses. All trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which is the law. He blotted it out which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Every accusation, that's why the scripture says in Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you can prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you condemn. Amen. This is the righteousness of God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He took away the accusation. He took away the thing that could be used to accuse you. Thank you Lord. Amen. And he nailed it to his cross. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why? Because no accusation can be brought against you to condemn you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let me finish like this. It's, so life, we, all, we say, well, life is what? Like a box of chocolates, I guess. Praise the Lord. Life is... There, you know, obviously as many metaphors for it as we have people to give them. But let's, use, let's just think of it this way. Life is like a classroom in the sense that we have this professor, this teacher, and we're all anxious about what kind of a grade we're going to get because it has to do with our future, right? Mm -hmm. Flunk out, you got to take it over or you got to, you know, take a lesser paying job, whatever it might be. So, because of Christ's finished work, we've been given an A. Yes. First day of class, we walk in the door, and the teacher says, here's your transcript, 4.0, all the way through. 
praise the Lord. I'm just waiting for graduation day. I don't even have to show up for class. Right? I mean, this is, you hang out at the frat house. <laughs> Every day's happy hour, all day long. Don't have to worry about cramming for anything. We've been given an A. So the threat of failure, the threat of judgment, the threat of embarrassment, humiliation, all of those things, condemnation, they've all been removed. I mean, and that, if you think about it, every, every anxiety that you might have about that class has been taken out of the picture. Yes. You've already got your A. It's done. He's, he's already told you, look, here it is, man. Nothing more for you to do. Nothing we do is going to make our grade any better. Nothing that we do is going to make that grade any worse. It's already been given. It's already in the records of the university. He's told us he's not going to blot it out. He's blotted out any possibility of us failing. Amen? So Christ, our substitute, has secured for us the everything, the A that we came into this world longing for. Praise God. So how about we celebrate? Enjoy the benefits of being an A student. Praise God. An A student in Him. Praise God. So what is our life? Our life is hid in Him. When will the fullness of time be for you? It'll be when we accept that. Yes. When we rest in it. Yes. When we're no longer striving, but relaxing yes. and rejoicing mm-hmm. and celebrating what Jesus has done. Thank you, Lord. Totally finished it, completed it. And all we get is, I don't know about you, but grandkids and kids, we used to say, if you get an A, you know, give you a dollar or five dollars. I think it was a dollar back then. I didn't have to give away a whole lot of money. <laughs> Praise the Lord. My kids are about on the same level as I was. I was willing to give it, but see, God has given us everything. We, we got an A, and he's saying, here, I'm going to give you a whole kingdom because of that A. And we're going, geez, that don't make sense because I never even took a test. I never studied. I just walked in one day, and he handed me my grades said now enjoy your life uh-huh. let's enjoy our lives Hallelujah. he has set us free for the sake of freedom yes. amen? amen and whom he sets free is free indeed Hallelujah. let's give him a hand clap this morning thank you, thank you Jesus praise the Lord praise the Lord amen it, grace is awesome it is awesome Praise God. It never, it never ceases to, to blow my mind what God has done. And I guess it never will. Eternity. We'll still be, because we'll have a better understanding then even than we have now. We'll, there'll be some shouting going on, I guarantee you. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. God bless. I appreciate everybody being here this morning. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. And bless everything you set your hand to this coming week. Enjoy your life in Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.